Hi folks, welcome to another edition of Government Matters, and in fact, this is a special edition of Government Matters. My name is Mike Dobbs. I've had the pleasure of being your host on Government Matters now for 50 episodes. Yay, that's what it's special. We made it to 50. And so far, no libel suits. Um, no one says no to us <laughs> so much. But um, uh, so I'm here to mm -hmm. talk about not only this program, which does sound a little bit self-indulgent, but don't worry, it won't be, but to also talk about Focus Springfield. And with me is the producer of the show and the executive director of Focus Springfield, and I'm very proud and happy to call him a very close friend, Steve Carey. Thank you very much, Mike. It's good it's to be It's a pleasure here. for you to be here. <laughs> it's different to be sitting in this seat, that's for sure, and to put my own microphone on, I'll tell you. Just so you know, folks, usually Steve is behind one of these cameras, um, but now he's in the hot seat. <laughs> Um, so we want to talk a little bit about this program. We want to talk about how it came about. And also, I've realized working with you folks for the years that I've been doing this, that a lot of people don't really understand what Focus Springfield is. They watch it. They watch the programming that you guys produce. Um, and Focus produces a very wide range of programming. So I, I want to talk a little bit about that with you as well. But I guess, first of all, um, how did how did this show come about? Because it was just sort of offered to me, but obviously <laughs> someone decided that we should do something like this. Well, our original executive uh, director, um, we had uh, John Abbott, who is a government nut. Uh, you know, he really was a big fan of, of reading you in The Reminder. And um, he came up with the idea, he just thought that we should have something that had a focus on elected officials, department heads, people who were in the, um, the wheels and the workings of government. And uh, he came up with the title, and um, he and I both were, realized that you would be the perfect host and moderator, and uh, for 50 shows, it certainly worked out that way. Uh, so it was, it was kind of the kernel of his idea, and um, then as we talked about it a little more and more, we decided, you know, why don't we just jump in and do it? And um, it has been it has been a lot of fun. It's been you know it, people. Uh, Public Access Television is a um, an organization that it's a stool with three legs, and P, E, and G are the things to think of. So the P is uh, we have a channel dedicated to each of these. That's public, and that will cover everything from sports to music, our coverage of Jazz Fest, uh, live um, uh, performance uh, performances of all kinds, uh, and then. The E in PEG is for uh, education. And we partner not solely, but quite a bit with Springfield Public Schools for, for that effort. We'll also have uh, graduations from STIC. From, we now do all of the Springfield High School graduations. And the third leg is G, which is government, which is where public access got its start. Um, so the difference people think we're public television, they confuse us quite a bit. Um, but PEG television, public access television, was kind of designed in the 60s and the 70s, uh, and solely in America, to become, in the United States, to become where government gets broadcast, at least recorded back then and then rebroadcasted. And now it's a live broadcast and live streamed in most places. And the idea is to let people see how government gets made while it's getting made. So if your street suddenly turns into a one way, how did that happen? Um, so that's kind of the brief history, a little bit of public access and government matters. So government has really been a huge, huge uh, component of what Focus Springfield's mission is about. Well, and I th if, if people didn't realize it before, they certainly realized it during the pandemic because Absolutely. the pandemic forced municipalities to come up with ways to, A, function. Uh, select board still had to meet. City council still had to meet. Yeah. Uh, town managers and administrators still had to do their, mayors had to do their thing. And the problem was is that you could not have these bodies and these individuals meeting and, and, and performing their duties in the same way. And at least right. in the city of Springfield, 
um, you guys really stepped up to the plate and provided the city with the technology so they could say, folks, here's the Springfield City Council. We're going to show you the council at work, even though the council, the councilors are from their living rooms. You know, <laughs> you guys came up with a lot of solutions for the city. We were both, uh, both lucky and prepared is, is kind of the quick answer to how it happened. Um, we had installed a, a fiber optic line from our studio two blocks away to City Hall. And that was done to have a robust connection, so our live, uh, our live broadcasts would would be solid, and we weren't reliant on a, um, a just a regular internet signal. Um, but what it ended up allowing us to do in the early days of the pandemic, I kind of forget about this until, you know, we start talking about it. But we had at one point Brendan Holland, who's kind of you know, functions as as our IT specialist, and. He started well before the pandemic saying, hey, we could actually turn cameras on from here and do the broadcast. And I thought, oh, my God, look, we're never going to have, there'll never be a need for that. And then, of course, the pandemic came and they could only get a certain amount of people in the room to do Mayor Sarno's Monday morning COVID announcement, which was the first thing that had to happen on a regular basis. And uh, if people remember, Helen Calton Harris would be there, the, the city's public health commissioner, um, the, um, the executives from the, the presidents and CEOs from the local hospitals, public safety, uh, everybody was there as we were figuring it out. But what it allowed us to do was to stay here and have another two people be able to enter that room so two other reporters could report on what was happening. Um, and then suddenly we realized the the ability for the equipment that we had, if we kept researching and buying a little bit more and more and, and, and developing our skills, um, we're now able almost 100% to have all robotic cameras be operated remotely um, to, to do all the proceedings of government, whether it's school committee, anything happening in room 220, um, anything in the city council chambers. We now have the... Um, City Council subcommittee room is, is wired, and the mayor's conference room and a couple other areas very soon will be on a network that, um, that can allow easier, easier sharing of government in its makings. Well, and this is, this is a really important part of the media's role in democracy, and that is to show what's happening. What I tried to do when I was executive ever, the reminder is to try to get as many reporters to these kinds of meetings, because inevitably what happens is people are saying, and you just brought it up uh, in, in the statement, like, well, how did my street get one way? What was that pro Why wasn't I told? Right. Well, maybe if you had watched a city council meeting, et cetera, et cetera, you, you would have had at least an inkling of what's going on. Part of the problem is that people are very busy, um, people are making assumptions that certain things happen in government, but thanks to an entity like Focus Springfield, you can watch it, for lack of a better term, raw and as it's happening. Um, there is no interpretation other than exactly. what you are seeing, what people are saying. Um, and for those people who are critical of the press having a bias one way or the other, what Focus does is saying, you're in that room with these people. You're listening to what they have to say. Right. You can determine for yourself as a resident of the community if you like it, if you dislike it, and who you need to talk to about either one of those opinions. We were amazed. Uh, number one, our, our main um, job is to get things on television. So to get things on the three channels that are on the Comcast network in Springfield. Um, we have no idea how many people are watching those channels. With all of our online offerings, whether it's live or immediately upon conclusion of a live event, within seconds, that's available on demand. And we can track all of those views. And I think one of the things that we noticed during COVID, um, especially initially, everybody was home. And they were looking for things to do. And I think people became a little more civically engaged. Um, both by the frequency of these meetings, because suddenly the subcommittee city council meetings, for example, 
those were never recorded right. and broadcast. Um, so that w turned into a whole new set of responsibilities and scheduling and challenges for us to figure out. And, um, and it, it's still a challenge, uh, but we, f we have figured it out. The kind of the joke is we're, we're a peg station with the P, E, and G. We're now a very small size P, very small size E, and very large G. And we're slowly morphing back to be able to cover the other aspects where we're responsible of covering the arts and athletics and uh, education. But, um, but the viewership really did explode. People became active. Um, the COVID, the mayor's COVID announcements were, um, were something comforting. I know initially with my neighbors and people I knew, they were like, oh, it's so good to be getting information. And, and they were long. There, was, there would be hours of information on there. But uh, yeah, having it offered online is a, is a whole new thing. And I think it, it really does help with the transparency, but it also thinks it helps with civic engagement. People are realizing that you know, government isn't this thing that's over there or the other side of, of, of Court Square for other people. It, it, those buildings are for, for us. And, right. and that period of time when, as you mentioned, people were, you know, counselors were, uh, and petitioners were appearing from their spare bedrooms and their kitchens, uh, as opposed to the regal mahogany walls of City Hall. Um, it was a big shift and, a, and a, just such a curveball. What you guys were able to do was to figure out all of the Zoom stuff. Um, and uh, Zoom proved to be both um, a, a blessing and a bane. <laughs> um, as, as anyone who either participated in, in a Zoom meeting and, and realized some of the pitfalls. Right, right. Um, but there you guys, are many. <laughs> and, but you guys were able to really work that out so the, the city could function much better during that period. I'll give a lot of credit um, to, to Brendan Holland and to Josue Vasquez, who um, are my colleagues here, and the ability to figure out how to get video shared online and on television and recorded for posterity um, are challenging, but they're nowhere near the challenges that come up with audio. So we've all been on a Zoom meeting where there's looping feedback. Um, we've all had the simple problems of I'm talking, but I didn't unmute my microphone. Um, we have figured out ways around that. They're expensive, they're technical. They're, if we were only to do sign language, we could have done that on day one of the pandemic, but getting the audio is something that uh, we're very proud of the work we've done. I'm very proud of what Josue and Brendan do, and we have uh, uh, Chris Polanco, uh, we have uh, George Anderson, uh, who are part-timers who help us with the municipal meetings, but it's, it's not an easy thing, and the, the, the fact that you can hear and see everybody is a huge part of our mission. Um, it's open meeting. I don't think I ever would have understand, understood the gravity of making this happen if I wasn't another hat I wear as chair of the Library Commission. And understanding open meeting laws suddenly were, you know, as a reporter, you see its value and understand its strength. But I suddenly, you know, we had that realization that, oh my gosh, uh, not only city council and school committee, but you know, the historical commission, the, uh, you know, every other department needed to be able to communicate and get their message out to legally function. And that was a weight that we, we felt for the city. And uh, anyway, we worked really hard. This was all science fiction when I was uh, my colleague's age. So when I was in my 20s and 30s, this stuff just wasn't able to happen. And I, I kept finding myself every once in a while in the middle of the pandemic. I would look at them and say, this is science fiction that we're doing right this now. This is science fiction. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you exactly. You, that, that, that's a television station in your pocket. Now. Right. And, you know, it, when, when you think about it, if you have an Apple Watch right. or one of those watches, mm -hmm. and I've seen people do phone calls and they're <laughs> talking in their watch and I'm going... That's the Dick Tracy wrist radio right there that exactly. I used to see in Dick Tracy when I was a nine-year-old boy, you know? Um, yes, yeah. it is science fiction. It's yeah. pretty astonishing what you can do now. It is, and, and, and it still has its, cha its challenges. You know, we figured it out, and um, I, I think one of the things I, I, I don't think our viewers know, uh, 
people think that this is a television station and we have dozens of people working here. I was here. just going to say. Yeah, we got three. <laughs> we got three, and one of them's an old guy. Uh, and um, we are blessed with some good part-time help, and we expect to expand in the near future. But um, we're, we're a small group of people, and, and d from the pandemic till now, we have just been working really, really hard. We're getting better with the work-life balance, but um, it's, it's not always easy. Well, and, and you've done certain things that I think sort of expand the description of what a community access station does. Like your community jams that you have here, yeah. for instance, where you have local musical groups playing and you'll have an audience, yeah. uh, people come in here. Um, I'm sure people walking back and forth to MGM think that this is a part of the MGM and that's a club in there. Because, that's exactly right. That's a, you know. So every three months or so, we clear out our whole lobby, we adjust our lighting, we put a bunch of cameras and set up a sound stage in there, and it's awesome. We actually get people who are whether it's a Thunderbirds game or whether they're going back and forth to the casino, they come in and they do think they're coming to MGM, especially the first few times that we did it when the casino was still relatively new. But um, we love that fact because it it you know when you make downtown Springfield have foot traffic and doors are open and this is free and there's some real talent from you know Jeremy Turgeon and uh, Hashima Moja. Uh, there's some incredible musicians who um, you know and how, how that community jam started was really just uh, it went from Jeremy Turgeon's house party to uh, something a little bit bigger and a lot of the musicians were um, professional teachers at Community Music School of Springfield. So they would start featuring their students first. So there'd be a friendly audience for the first half hour, 45 minutes or so, where they'd get to play. And now we've kind of moved on and have a great relationship with um, the SciTech Jazz uh, Band. And they'll send a couple of their musicians. And, and then the professionals will step up and play with them for a little while. But um, you know, getting the arts and especially the local music scene, because Springfield's really has an incredible jazz history. Um, we're working recently with Avery Sharp. I was just going to say, you yeah. just did an Avery Sharp special. Amazing, amazing, uh, very famous, internationally known uh, bass player, uh, played with McCoy Tyner and all the greats for many, many years, but is a composer and a musician of note himself. And, you know, he just did this great video, uh, I mean, great CD that he's, he's developing. It was, I think, funded by the, um, I don't want to get it wrong, I think it's a mass... Institute or New England uh, Fine Arts uh, Association, but I'm, I'm getting that wrong. But uh, what he did right was he wanted to play this music, uh, and he calls it My Neighbor's Keeper. And during the pandemic, you know, he had had some, some losses of loved ones and was watching the horrible news stories and said, well, we all need to take care of each other. And he wanted to play initially at a homeless shelter or somewhere. We were, weren't gaining traction with that, but we talked to Sheriff Kochi's team, and he, they got a hundred of their prisoners to enjoy the first performance, live performance, of his band. And it was uh, Avery on upright bass. Uh, he had three violinists and a, a cello, um, an incredible keyboard uh, player, and drums and percussion. And, um, and then he did a concert uh, at at a local church, and then community music school, and then we followed him for many days, three days, at uh, Ghost Hit Recording, a, a very, very professional, polished uh, recording studio in an old church in West Springfield. Um, but those are the things, don't get me wrong, we love doing Zoom meetings for government meetings, but those were the things. No, they that... don't, they don't <laughs> love Zoom. But No one loves Zoom. No one loves Zoom, yeah. we are government nerds. But that idea of, of when you're getting into the business and doing camera and lighting and sound, to be able to shoot live performances, whether it's sports, dance, theater, music, those are the sweet spots. Those are, and it really promotes great things that are happening in Springfield and celebrates uh, musicians from Springfield, at least from Greater Springfield. Now you've done. The, the annual Jazz Fest, too. That's a huge thing for us. That ha And that, yeah, this will be the 10th, yeah, this summer will be the 10th anniversary of the Springfield Jazz and Roots Fest. They've moved it from early August 
to the third Saturday in July. Um, it had a conflict with enshrinement. And um, that is a wonderful free jazz event. Um, people come from all over. Is it still at Court Square? And uh, No, they're actually doing it now over in Stern Square. Oh, okay. Which I initially wasn't excited about. I thought this was going to be a difficult, I don't know how the flow was going to go. It turns out it's a super spot. And um, they often have a second stage. And um, so there's a, a main Charles Neville stage. And um, his wife, Kristen, um, the, the two of them are really a force with Evan Plotkin to to get that turned into something big. And it's now just a really well-known, well-produced event. And, you know, we have, I forget, uh, hundreds of thousands of hits on our YouTube channel um, for the years that we've covered it. Uh, some incredible acts and uh, free. Well, I have to say that two of the things that I've enjoyed most doing here um, is being able to talk to Congressman Neal. Um, super, super and, person to have on. Um, I mean, we've had a lot of interesting government officials, local and statewide. Suzanne Bump was very, very good to talk to. She was great, the former state auditor. We had her twice. Um, oh. The other thing I really enjoyed doing, a, I took a great deal of pride, especially in the aftermath, was when um, we had the debate for sheriff. Oh, yeah. Uh, because... Um, I'm just going to grease my boss here a little bit, folks, so if you've got to make a sandwich or something. Um, no, stay. This is stay. a good part. <laughs> no one expected yeah. what happened at that. And what happened was you broadcast that live. That was our first live debate out of here. So we had a live component, and then, of course, it was immediately archived and put up on the web. And... The amount of people who watched that, I think it completely and totally surprised uh, the, sure did. Uh, the um, commercial television folks in our, in our market. I think it surprised a lot of people that the public access, the little public access exactly. station, yeah. had something and did it so well that it got broad regional attention. That, it surprised me. I mean, I, I, I thought we'd gain some traction with uh, Sheriff Mike Ash retiring after 40 years. There's a lot of eyeballs and a lot of interest. But to see that number go to 10,000, I don't know where it's at now. People still actually click on it. Um, it, it. It blew my mind when I saw that we had that kind of traction. And within, I think, 36 hours, we had gotten up to like 8,500 views. And by the following weekend, it, it approached 10,000, and it's kind of hovered a little north of there. It was a very important election. It was, it was an election that clearly was attracting a lot of attention. Um, right. But at the, at the same time, I think that it sort of shattered what to expect from a public access station. And that was what we wanted to do. Um, I got my start in television and public access when Continental Cable was here in the 80s. My mom saw an article little blurb in the paper that said they're looking for interns. And um, for those of you who are too young to know this, there were three TV stations uh, that were uh, four on a really nice clear day. You could pull New Haven in. But um, when cable TV came and suddenly we had this plethora of a dozen channels uh, and it, it was, uh, Continental Cable did a great job. They were probably the, the largest public access TV station for whatever reason, was located here. Uh, I think we have a combination of former Mayor Neal and uh, Mayor Ted DeMauro to thank. The two of them, it was the DeMauro administration that inked the deal, um, but it was a many, many years process. And to get that in and to tear up streets and for people to take down their antennas, it was a revolution unlike anything until the computer came into our lives. But um, when I got my start there, we were doing sports and music and documentaries and government, and there was a lot of resources plugged into it, and there were dozens of people who worked there, and um, and it was great. And then uh, public access in Springfield kind of waned. There were several new companies that came in and, and bought it. Um, the How we exist is from people paying their, their Comcast cable bill. 
So whatever provider gets to hook up your cable TV and your internet is responsible for, was responsible also for having uh, a public access TV station that handled the public educational and government broadcasts. But they really didn't do much for many, many years. And I had kind of lobbied Mayor Ryan. Um, the city was not in a great position to uh, embark on something like that during the financial challenges uh, that they faced at the time. And then Mayor Sarno was very receptive, especially when it came time. There's the tornado in 2011. And right before that, the city had always had uh, less than favorable press. And I used to be upset because I worked, uh, I worked far away all the time, but I was always living in Springfield. And I thought there's all these great things that happen here that we never see or hear about that much on the media. And it took the tornado for us and for Mayor Sarno to kind of realize that this is the kind of stuff that we're trying to do. I had gotten a small grant to do positive stories. I had covered one thing, the 375th parade, just as something to do um, that was Springfield centric. And we had some other plans. And then the tornado came and I realized that my efforts were probably better placed covering the many press conferences. Because back then people had, you know, branches on their house. They had uh, uh, power lines down. There were gas. There's all kinds of stuff. And and we would just cover the where he would have public safety um, give tips, and we would put the phone numbers for people to call. Then we started the mayor and us. We started realizing uh, at the time when Comcast was sort of deciding to get out of the public access television portion of their responsibility. And, and we took over, and that's kind of how we came to be. And, you know, I, I think I was talking to you earlier about where the tale of two disasters, uh, the, the, between the tornado and the uh, pandemic, we have kind of reinvented ourselves each time. And that's our goal now is to reinvent ourselves in a post-COVID period. Um, we've, we've been suffering from the longest eviction in mankind, I think. Uh, so we're being evicted from this particular property. And, and we have eyeballs and hopes and aspirations to end up in city stage. Um, it will be the second vacant uh, location that Focus would have plugged into. And um, so we're very hopeful to have news on that in the near future. And that would keep you downtown, which aids with a certain element of uh, econo economic development in the downtown area. Yeah, and that's, that, that's another arm that people don't realize public access really does. So, you know, we, we, for a while, we, you know, we had eight employees. So there's a little bit of economic development there, as the mayor always likes to say, the good four-letter word, J-O-B-S. Um, but we have plugged in and done a lot of work. You know, I think just covering the arts and, 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 and doing everything that we do is a little bit of economic development. But we've gotten involved with, uh, with the city trying to activate the buildings across the street from MGM and put together a video uh, where Josue Vasquez is our, our new, is, he's got his nickname from Mayor Sarno, Airman uh, Vasquez. So he has done drone work that is just fantastic, that really feature the city and show the city in a new light. And um, so, so at any rate, we, we, we keep trying to do new things. Well, and look, it's 28 minutes. We're, we're precise. It's we're like, precise at where we're supposed to be. Almost like we planned this. I know. <laughs> well, and again, uh, it's, it's been a complete pleasure. Uh, I, I look forward to working with you guys for as long as you want uh, an old fat guy with facial hair and glasses, which yeah, in the TV industry, I would never be on commercial TV. They would take one look at me and say, you know, shave the beard, dye the hair, get contacts, lose weight. But and here uh, you are, guys, getting two old fat guys <laughs> for the price of one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it's been an absolute pleasure. And, Same here. Um, we're going to be doing more of Government Matters. Um, I'm going to try to persuade him to do some other programming as well. Um, I, I, I miss our it. little talk show that we did at Smokey Joe's. That's something to bring back. Yeah, yep. we had fun with doing that. So, <laughs> Well, thank you, Mike. Well, thank you, Steve. And folks, thanks for watching uh, this 50th uh, edition of Government Matters, and there'll be at least 50 more before we hang it up. Thanks very much.